I've come, I believe that God has a word for you guys. Okay, I give my life to this. I believe that a vessel who gives their life to God can be used by God. I, I, I live a life of sanctification. I sanctify myself for this reason alone. This ain't a game to me. I sanctify myself to make sure that what I'm giving you is not me. That it's him. And you can feel it on your skin already. Come on. Because it's real. It's life and death. And God's sheep are hurting. And we need shepherds. And we need a revival in the church. In the church. That's sad. In the, how are we going to ask for revival in the church? If the church is revival, that's crazy to me. Right? So there's some things that are missing, right? So I believe that God can take what's common and he can sanctify it. I believe that. He's done it all through the scriptures. He did it to a mountain. He did it to a bush. He did it to some water, turned it into wine. He said, hey, take off your sandals. This is hollow ground. God can do that because it's about what God wants to do. And I believe that when we come together and we sanctify this place and we sanctify each other and we come into agreement, we say, you know what, Lord, do something amazing in this room. He'll do it. I believe he'd do it. I'm crazy enough to believe that God is God. Right? And if he doesn't show up, guys, I don't know what we're going to do. I'm being serious. Like, where are we going to go? And God knows this. Right? And this is where boldness comes in when you recognize that God is God and everything in the, everything in the kingdom to God is possible. But to us, it's impossible. So everything that God asks us to do is impossible. That's how we prove it's kingdom. So everything that we're going to ask from God is impossible. Think about it. And like I say, we're the place where the impossible meets God. We are the place. Right? That's how, that's how covenant works. We talked about this today. Covenant's two parts. But we forget it's really three parts. Because God brings his part, that's his part. We bring our part, that's two parts, but that creates a whole different identity because there's a third part, and that's us and God together, which means there's a third part to it because we're unified. And so everything that I teach comes from this place, the finished work of Christ, what's already been done. Everything, you, are, you already have everything, everything that pertains to life and godliness on the inside of you. My job and the job of, of, of the preachers and teachers it's to get you to recognize that there's already something inside of you that maybe you ain't tapped into it, but it doesn't mean it's not there. And God will insist on believing his own word, even if you don't. That's why he's God, and we're not. Right? So even if you say, I don't believe that, he's like, and? And? Right? Guys, everywhere in scripture, we're going to talk about this in a little bit. Every time, you got one guy that says, Jesus says, I haven't seen faith like this, right? Man, you have great faith, right? And God moves. And then in this side, oh, you have little faith, and God moves. Have you noticed it didn't matter if they had big faith, little faith, or no faith? God moved. Because it has nothing to do with you. It has to do with him, and your faith can't stop him. You know that, right? Your faith can't stop them. See, a lot of us are being pastored in the old man. But I'm going to pray real quick before I get started. Because once I get started, I ain't going to stop. Right? Can we pray real quick? Can we honor the Holy Spirit? Hey, did you know the Holy Spirit is the, the, the marriage counselor? He's the one that comes in and counsels you to get closer to God. So you can birth something. Right? So we can become one with God. And when we become one with God, we birth something, which is the Christ in us, right? The hope of glory, the, the new man, right? So we're going to pray that the Holy Spirit, just is kind enough, which he is, that he'll just come into the place and do what he needs to do. Because I believe that when the word is spoken, the Holy Spirit will begin to speak to all of you in a different way. He'll start healing and touching and doing things that you probably will never see. But it'll be done. I believe that he's doing things right now in the spirit. And you'll probably never see it. You'll never see it. 
right? Come on, man. I really believe that. I believe that, right? The sun's going to come up tomorrow and it had nothing to do with you. It's going to set tonight and it has nothing to do with you. You take a breath and it has nothing to do with you. That's the God we serve, right? Come on, man. You take a breath because he wants you to. That's the God I serve. You know, I got this saying, if hell didn't make you, it can't break you. You're kingdom made, baby. You can't be broken. You're unbreakable. Come on, man. So here we go. Let's pray. So, Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, I know that you can push back time. You can push back everything. Father, I ask in the name of Jesus, according to your word, that you push back everything that would come against what you have to give your people, Lord God. I pray in the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, that you begin to move in a way, Lord God, that will just cause people to lose their minds, Lord God. Cause them to see things and hear things in a way, Lord God, that only you can speak to them, Lord God. And I ask, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, that you just allow this vessel this, this thing, Lord God, that I'm trying to control and learn how to maneuver, that you allow this thing to speak your word, Lord God. Guard my mind and pray. I, I, I pray in the name of Jesus that the enemy not steal anything. It says that the enemy will come and steal the word of God from their hearts. I pray in the name of Jesus that nothing will be taken, that it will take root, Lord God, and that it will grow and it will produce so much fruit, Lord God, that we won't even be able to count it, Lord. I ask that in your precious name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Wow. Where was I at? Yeah, Jesus, that's right. Guys, I, I'm just excited because there's so much that I want to talk about. And, and I, was, I was in the hotel, and, and Quelio was talking to me, and I was sitting there, and, and I'm like, what am I going to talk about, Lord? What do you want me to talk about? And I'm like, okay, then that's what we're going to talk about, right? Hey, have you guys... Have you guys ever, um, let's just go there. Let's go to 2 Samuel real quick because I want to talk about something. I was talking about this today during lunch. And uh, we're going to talk about David when he brings the Ark of the Covenant into the city. That's in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6. Have you guys, are you guys familiar with that? Yeah? Did you guys know that the Ark of the Covenant represents the presence of God? And it's in a box, right? It's in a box. And this box, it holds, well, it's not, it's, it's crazy because it doesn't hold the presence of God. God decides to go there. Like, that's crazy to me. Like, I'm the God of the universe, but I choose to live in this box for you. The God of all the universe decides I'm going to be in this box that you're going to make with your hands. And I'm going to dwell here because the covenant says that. I'll be your God, and you'll be my people, and I will dwell among you, which means I will stay here and be faithful no matter what, where this box is. Ain't that crazy? Do you guys remember the time they kidnapped God? They took the box. You remember that? Remember they kidnapped him? They kidnapped him. Right? Could you imagine God is like, no, no, don't take me. Could you imagine? And they put him in the God, of, the hall of gods, right? Do you remember that? Right? And there was this one God called Dagon. Dagon God. Right? And he fell face down. Remember that? And what happened next? These guys come in, and they have to pick their God up. I tell people, man, if you got to pick your God up, you need another God. Right? So they're picking him up. Right? And then something started happening, right? People started getting boils and plagues. So who rescued God? Who rescued him? Anybody know? Yeah. God doesn't need rescuing. Where does God live? He lives in you. And you need rescuing? Do you need rescuing? Come on, let's get real. Hey, if God in the Bible didn't need rescuing and his box wasn't crying out for help, why are we crying out for it? 
Because a box has common sense. Oh, wait, it didn't have no common sense. That's why I can't cry out. Does this make sense? We talked about this today during lunch, right? Do you remember um, there was this rock in the desert? And Moses was supposed to speak to the rock. Do you guys remember what was coming out of this rock? Water was coming out of a rock. Okay, wrap your mind around this because I think sometimes we hear stories and we kind of, you know, lullaby them. We hear them so much that we kind of really forget the context and what it really means. And we're like, oh, you know, some rock spewing water. But that was 1.6 million gallons of water out of one rock a day. Come on, man. And Paul confirmed that this rock that followed him through the desert was Jesus. Right? A rock followed them through the desert. Here's what's interesting about this story. That the rock, it can't argue with God. It ain't going to say, well, where am I going to get water from? (laughs) Well, how? That. Did the rock look around and say, man, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of cows and chickens. And Where am I going to? I'm a rock. I got no water to. Where? What? Here's what I'm trying to say. The word of God, when it's spoken over something, that's all it needs is the word of God. Hear me out. When the word of God says you're going to give water. That's what you're going to do. It ain't going to ask, where am I going to get it from? It ain't going to ask, I ain't gifted in this area. I'm a red rock. I'm a blue rock. I'm a this rock. No. God said, I'm demanding water out of you. The Bible says that rivers of living water shall flow from your belly. Hey, the Bible says that you had a heart of stone. And he turned it into a heart of flesh, right? Which means that that rock represented the heart of man. It needed to be spoken to by a man of God or a woman of God or someone who knew the word of God had to speak over that rock. God didn't speak to the rock. I don't know where your, your theology is at, but according to the oral law, maybe Eric knows this, but Miriam well, no, was it Miriam? What was uh, Moses' sister's name? Miriam. Miriam supposedly was the one that spoke over the rock every morning. If you do your study, right? I can't get into the midrash and all that because people are like, oh, we don't read that. Well, it's pretty interesting because when you love God, you want to read everything that has to do with the word of God, right? And so what ended up happening is she ended up dying. And the day that she died, they were all asking for water because there was no water to drink. Do you guys remember that? And that's when Moses struck the rock because she was dead. And he struck it because he was grieving his sister. And he got in trouble because he misrepresented God. But my point is this. If God is going to speak to something, he's expecting something to come out of it. Yeah? How much more if he lives in something? Okay, that's, that's where I want to go. Okay? He lives in every single person through Christ. Can we, can, can we agree with this? Okay. So remember, God didn't need rescuing. Hey, a mature Christian doesn't need rescuing. Because he understands that he can never be enslaved. He can never be trapped. Hey, Paul was in prison because he had to go to prison on his own. If he wouldn't have went to prison, he wouldn't have went to prison. And he wasn't in prison because they had him there. He was in prison because he chose to be there. Do you guys remember when Peter and, and Silas just started singing and dancing? What happened? There's nothing that can hold a child of God. Nothing. If they were persecuted and they died, it's because they chose it. They chose to die. They chose to be stoned to death. They chose it. Ain't that crazy? Think about it. I'm not saying go get stoned. What I'm saying is... They wanted to be martyred. Look, God was so real for them, they wanted to be martyred. Because they had seen so much of God that they were like, man, this is so amazing. I'm, there's nothing else I can give. I'm just going to give my life. That's the reality of it. And we don't ever talk about this, right? And this isn't a good message, guys. 
It isn't. Because nobody in here wants to give their life to Jesus. I'm being serious. We say we gave our lives to Jesus, but did we really give our lives to Jesus? You guys remember Stephen? He got stoned, right? Did you know that's the only place in the Bible that it says that Jesus was standing on the right hand of God? Everywhere else it says he was sitting. The only time he's not sitting is when one stands for him. Because Stephen stood up and Jesus stood up. You know what that means? That means that the Christ in you is what's doing everything. So it wasn't Stephen that stood up. It was the Christ in him that stood up. And when he looked up, he saw him standing up. So when you lay hands on the sick, who's laying hands on the sick? When you're prophesying, who's prophesying? When you're believing, who's believing? And that's the shift. We have to shift from one domain into the other. And this is, tr- this is real stuff. Like, this is, this is as real as it gets. And I know it's kind of weird for some people when they hear this kind of stuff. Because they're like, wait, 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 wait. What, what, what? Because it's so backwards. This is backwards. Everything that we're learning is backwards. Either Jesus is Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Right? So, this box. Right? <laughs> this, this box. We'll talk about this box. This box is amazing. Do you guys know what was inside the box? What was in the box? Anybody know? There was the golden pot of manna. Aaron's rod that bloomed. And the law and the Ten Commandments, right? So you had the Ten Commandments, Aaron's rod, and the manna. And then you had the Spirit of God that sat on the box. You know what's interesting is you have these two cherubs on top, the cherubs. It said that. When Jesus resurrected, it said there was two angels. One was at the feet and one was at the head. Yeah? Come on. Come on. You remember in the garden when Adam got cast out of the garden? It says there was two angels with flaming swords guarding the way. Right? Story of Lot. God shows up to Abraham. Abraham standing there at the tent. Two angels there. These angels are the same angels that are standing there in the garden, guarding the way, and the same two angels that are standing at the feet and the head of Jesus. You know what they do? They go to Sodom and Gomorrah, and they destroy it. Two angels. You know why these angels destroyed it? Because if you read in a... Genesis, I believe it's 18, it says that Lot went to Sodom because he saw a garden like the one of the Lord. Which means that people were creating a garden to create the presence of God. And they were saying, we're going to create the same thing God created, but it was a counterfeit. And what happened was that two angels were on their way. And if you guys remember, for those who haven't read it, I'll just paraphrase it to bring context. It says that Abraham was standing at his, his tent. And he saw three men coming. One was the Lord and two were, were angels. But Abraham didn't know he was God. He didn't know it was angels. Right? We assume that he did. But no, he didn't know. So what happened is they walk up there and Abraham says, hey, let me prepare a meal for you. Right? And he, he tells uh, Sarah, hey, get three measures of meal, which is a hundred loaves. He told her to make a hundred loaves for these angels. You would ask yourself, Why would they make 100 loaves? Well, that's easy because they're on a journey. And so she didn't just make enough for them to eat. She made enough for them to take with them. Now, here's what's interesting. Abraham had said, Lord, if we find this many righteous, will you spare the city? If you notice, Abraham never went to the city. So how would he know who's righteous and who's not if Abraham never went? The angels went. And you know what they took with them? Bread. And you know what they did with this bread? They were supposed to sleep in the center of the city that night. And they were going to give this bread. And whoever took this bread would have been saved. But because Lot said, no, come eat at my house, they went to their house. And all of them were destroyed except for the family of Lot. Because these are the angels that are guarding the way to the tree of life. Because it's a way. They're not guarding the tree of life. They're guarding 
the way to the tree of life. And the way is how you walk. The way is how you live. And there was people in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah saying, we created the garden and we also have a way. And so what happened? These angels showed up and they were guarding the way. And in fact, they took Lot and his family and saved them because they knew the way. Does this make sense? That's a whole nother conversation. These are the angels that are in the ark that face sin. In fact, there's a teaching that says whenever the people of God were, uh, whenever they moved the ark away, some people believe that the cherubs faced away from, from God, and then when they were right standing, they would face with them. That's what they say. I don't know. I don't know how biblically correct this is, right? It's a crazy thought. So here's what's interesting. So here's this box. Now remember, what's inside of this box is powerful, okay? We forget, and we just talked about it, is the Ten Commandments, the golden pot of manna, and, and Aaron's staff. Okay, there's a scripture that says, I remove your heart of stone and give your heart of flesh, and I write my laws in your heart and in your mind. That's the Ten Commandments, right? Okay, so you got them on the inside of you, right? And then Jesus said, I'm the manna from heaven. Yeah? And where's he live? Inside of you. And then we're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. So Aaron's rod's on the inside of us, right? But now the Holy Spirit doesn't sit on top of you like he did on the ark. He lives on the inside of you. Yeah? Okay, so let me tell you what the enemy does. The enemy comes and he puts a mirror in front of you and you look in the mirror and you go, eh, that's just me. But God says, no, it's not just you. You're a container of my glory. You don't understand. What you're looking at ain't you. What you're looking at is something else. Yeah? And so the enemy wants you to see things carnally. This is why Romans chapter 8 tells you that those that are in the flesh cannot please God. Because if you're in the flesh, you're only going to see a bunch of containers. And retainers, right? But when you're in the spirit of God, you see everyone. See, we're hosting the presence of God because he's on the inside of every single person in here. And so we're just hosting him. The heavens, right? The heavenly host. So we're hosting the presence of God. All of us, right? And I love it when he says, you know, make me a place so I can make my abode with you, which means that God wants to live and dwell with us, right? So with that context... With that context, we're going to go to 2 Samuel chapter 6, okay? Remember, David didn't know what he was carrying. He didn't know what was going on, okay? Yeah? So we'll start with uh, chapter 6. I'll just go down uh, chapter 6, verse 3. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart. Okay, let me just stop right there. Did you, did you, guys, did you guys hear me read that? That's in uh, chapter 6, verse 3. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart. Any problems here? What's the problem here? They have it on a cart. Eh. Wrong. You do not put the presence of God on an ox cart. It has to be carried by priests. Wrong thing. This means David didn't know what he had. He didn't know what he had. Now, remember, David's going to bring the ark into the city. Remember that. So, he's like, hey, let's just put it on a box. Let's just put it on an ox cart. We'll just bring it in like some cabbage. <laughs> Come on, let's be real. Just throw it on there. Just, just bring it in. It's no big deal. No big deal. He forgot. And there's this guy, right? This thing starts shaking. There's this guy named Uzzah. He's like, oh, my gosh, this thing's sliding off. I better stop it. And he puts his hand on it. And what happens to him? He drops dead. Right? Why did he drop dead? Because, first of all, he's not a priest. And he's touching what's holy. And he hasn't been sanctified. And God's already pissed because it's on an ox cart. Yeah. 
He's hot. Hey, guys. Invite the Queen of London here and pick her up on a moped. That's, excuse me, the king now because she died. Bring the king of London to the U.S. and pick him up at the airport on a moped and watch what happens. What do you think would happen? Yeah? We laugh, but we forget that's how we carry the presence of God. Come on. It's funny, isn't it? Till you realize you're doing it. How you carrying it? See, it just got real. But that's how God sees it. Because it's him. Man, it got real real quick. Hey, I, I, I think about this stuff too, man. Like, how am I carrying you, Lord? Did you know half the stuff you deal with has nothing to do with the enemy? It has to do with you not honoring God. Because if we carry the presence right, we wouldn't be sick. We wouldn't be dealing with stuff. We wouldn't be getting bit by snakes. Right? If we just learn how to carry his presence, we'd be good. But because we don't teach people how to carry the presence, we just want it to show up. No, we don't want it to show up. We want to take it home. What? We want it to be home. We got to get them ready. We got to prepare ourselves, man. Right? Here we go. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Obinda that was in uh, Gadea and Uzzah, Ohio and the sons. I'll just keep going. 6-6. Six, six. And when they came to the Nakons, I can't even say this, the threshing floor of Uzzah, put forth his hand of the ark of God and took hold of it, and the oxen shook it. The ox is pulling this thing. You know how many Christians I know that are like an ox in the desert, going in circles, talking about, I don't know where the presence of God is. Think about it. Carrying the presence of God in your loss for 40 years. Carrying the presence of God and still sick. Carrying the presence of God and still wondering. Come on, man. This is some real talk right here. You know how many people I know like that? That used to be me. Carry the presence of God. Use the presence of God. Use the power of God. And I was the ox. Didn't even know what was going on. Right, here we go. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah. And God smote him there for his error. And there he died. By the ark of God. So he died right there. The presence of God killed him. What? Hey Amen. I know a lot of men of God who have the presence of God, and they be killing all day long with what they say, how they act, what they do. Come on, man. Don't touch me. Don't touch God's anointed. Come on, man. I want you to touch me. I want you to get some of this. <laughs> Come on, man. And David was displeased because the Lord had made a, a breach upon Uzzah. Man, how many of you get mad when something bad happens to you? You get mad. Did you know half the stuff that happens to you is because you ain't carrying the presence of God right? And had nothing to do with God. We'll never talk about this stuff. Okay, look, let me, let, me bring, let, me bring, let me bring some context in. Let me, let, me, let me bring it to you like this. What happens when Jesus is your sacrifice and we reject certain parts of Jesus? What happens? What happens when you reject certain parts of Jesus? That's why I say if Jesus is the Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. So we just want him to be healer, but we don't want him to be comforter. Right? We want him to be deliverer, but we don't want him to be long-suffering. Hey, guys, how many of you want to see 100% miracles? Yeah? You know that's a trap, right, what I'm doing right now. I'm trapping you. Show of hands, how many of you want to see 100% miracles? Okay. How many of you want to walk in 100% long-suffering? 
How many of you want to walk in 100% patience? Goodness. Oh, here's one. Faithfulness. How can we forget those? You want to know why? Because to get 100% healings, you got to walk out Jesus 100%. So when people tell me, you know, I only get 10%, 9%, I'm like, really what you're saying is you're only walking about 9% of who Jesus is. He's not a tally, man. He's not like, you know, you chalk it up. He is who he is, right? So this is interesting. You know, long suffering, you guys. See, we think that when we become Christians that we're not going to suffer anymore. Jesus didn't come so you wouldn't suffer. He came to teach you how to suffer so you could grow. There's no avoiding suffering. In this world, you will have trials. You will have tribulations. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Count it all joy. All joy? But I didn't get what I wanted. Doesn't matter. And David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how should the ark of the Lord come unto me? So now he sees it as a curse. You see that? Man, I got this thing, and it just killed somebody. Man, I just can't do nothing right. (laughs) Right? So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David. So he wouldn't bring it in. He wouldn't bring it in. Man, you know how many believers won't bring it in? Won't bring it in because they're afraid of what it's going to cost them? Because they're afraid of what's going to happen? Hey, you know what? The minute Jesus moves in, you're going to die. That's what this is about. We don't want to die. Because when you move in, we're going to die. Yeah, you're going to die. There's no escaping this. No one gets out alive in the kingdom. You have to die to get in. You have to die to get in. Nobody wants to die, but everybody wants to go to heaven. Everybody. Oh, that day. Hey, I remember I was in Texas one time, and I went to this little church, right? God bless them. They were all older, like older, older. And they were, that's all it was, was, you know, seasoned saints. And I remember there was only 25 of them. And they were singing songs like, oh, we can't wait. Ooh, when we go to heaven, how great it's going to be. And they're just singing about, they can't wait. And I went up there and I'm like, I don't even know if I should even do a healing service in here. Because you all want to go. How you think you're going to go? You're going to get sick, and you're going to die because you all want to go. So either you want to go or you want to stay. Which one? Because if you want to stay, we can't be singing we want to go. So which one is it? Come on, I'm just being serious. And I told him, bro, that's why your congregation is dying off because they can't look forward to anything except dying. But what if you're already dead? Come on. What if you're already dead? Colossians 3.3, for you died and your life is hidden with God in Christ. You're already dead. You're dead, man. Guys, what kind of people go to heaven? Do you guys know? You're going to love this one. Forgiven people go. Forgiven. And forgiven people don't look like they should be going because they needed to be forgiven. (laughs) So the people that are going to heaven are the people you don't want to (laughs) forgive. Ain't that crazy? (laughs) Hey, just because God forgives you doesn't mean his sheep will. Come on. I'm being honest. Hey, and David was afraid. Okay, so here it is, 10. So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him, into the city of David. But David carried it aside into the house of Oban Eden. 
the Gidonite. Now, if you guys do your homework on Obed-Eden, he's a priest. So he took the ark to the house of a priest. And you guys know what a priest does, right? A priest is raised in the service of taking care of the presence of God. That's what a priest does. So he takes it to the priest, which means the priest knows what to do. Yeah? And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Eden, the Gittadite, for three months. Remember that. That's 90 days. Okay? And the Lord blessed Obed-Eden and all his household. I'm talking his household. Everybody related to him. Not just him. His household. The dog, the chickens, the horses. His household, everything that he owned was blessed. All of it. You know why? Because when you know how to take care of the presence of God, your whole house is going to be blessed. Oh, but how come he get blessed and I don't? Because he knows how to take care of the presence of God, and you don't want to. Tell people that. So when people get mad, hey, you know, I want to be blessed too. Take care of the presence of God. Watch what happens. Make room for him in your life. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Eden. Three months, we know it was blessed. And it was called King David. The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Eden and all that pertaineth unto him. Whoa. Everything that he owned was blessed. It wasn't his land, his tools, his shoes, everything. Right? Everything that he owned. My God, could you imagine? Could you imagine... And all that pertain unto him because of the ark of God. Because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God. So he got like, oh, snap. I had the lotto in my hand and gave it to somebody else. (laughs) Right? Could you guys imagine? I mean, think about it. You had the presence of God in your hands. You had it. It was that moment that you just got scared. That moment that the presence of God was right there. But you got so scared of what somebody else was thinking. You got so scared that you might jump. You got so scared that you might go on your face. You got so scared that you just might die and praise God. You got so scared that you let somebody else get it. That's Bible. (laughs) This is old covenant. This ain't even new covenant yet. This is old covenant people getting blessed. This before it even lived inside of them, they were getting blessed. This is them carrying a box and they're getting blessed. (laughs) Oh. Man, a lot of us would be like, man, I wish I had that box. You got something better. (laughs) Oh. Let me keep going. So he went there, and he's like, man, uh uh-uh, I got to have this. So he wanted to bring it into the city, right? So he goes and gets it, right? So David went and brought up the ark. (laughs) Could you imagine Albert Eden was like, no, don't take it. Because remember, back then, it was just on the box. Imagine. It was just on the box. So David went and got it, and Albert Eden was like, dang. Ugh. There goes the presence of God. Bye. Oh, man. What I would do to have that box come back. What I would do. You guys know where I'm going. (laughs) Sheesh. What happened, Obed Eden? Oh, man, it was the best, best three months of my life. Man, the dog was even blessed. My God, you should have seen the eggs them chickens were laying. My God, did you see the grapes? Oh, my God. Even the, the oxen, we didn't have to tell them to plow. They were already throwing the yoke on and going to work. Oh, my God. Remember, there was a cloud 
over the Mishkan. You think there wasn't a cloud over his house? There was a pillar of fire at night. You think there wasn't a pillar of fire at his house? There was manna every morning in the desert. Who do you think was at his house? Man, I'm jealous for that. Come on, man. Quail showed up. Quail showed up, was like, eat me. <laughs> in the desert. Could you imagine? We want meat. Here comes the quail. Eat me. <laughs> Didn't even have to hunt. Their clothes didn't fall apart for 40 years. They didn't get sick. Their clothes grew with them. I mean, that's the reality of God's presence, man. You guys need to wake up to that. He didn't write it down so you could go, ooh. He wrote it, do he wrote it down so you could go, ah. <laughs> My God, you did that in the desert, and they didn't even know who you were. You were training them. My God. <sighs> Sheesh. Man, what was, oh. come on, God, we need that. We need that for our, we need that for our land. Come on, man. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed Eden in the city of David with gladness. Oh, he knew what he had this time because he talked to somebody. You're going to find out as the scripture goes on that something happened to David. He was carrying it a little different. Hey, man, when you know what you got, whoo, you're going to carry it a little bit different. <laughs> hey, I was scared before. But I ain't scared now. Oh, I was putting it on ox cart, but I ain't putting it on ox cart now. Oh, no. Uh-uh. No, 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 no. I see what it did at your house. <laughs> and it was so. And it was so. They buried the ark of the Lord and had gone six paces and sacrificed oxen. And They're carrying it now. They're carrying it now because the priest told them, hey, look, man, you're doing it all wrong. You brought it in on an ox cart, bro. You can't do that. You got to carry it. The priest got to carry it. It's got to be carried right. You got to do certain things. Look, see, it's not enough to be a king. You can't just carry it in. Like a king? You got to carry it in like a priest too. And that's what David learned. And we're going to read it. Watch this. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. You ever see somebody dance with all their might? My God. It wasn't like. No. You ever see that? That ain't what's happening here. He said with well, all his might. I ain't even about to do that because I'm too old to dance with all my might. I might fall. Right? But how do you even, have you ever guys ever seen um, um, Footloose? Yeah, he's just, yeah, that dude's getting it in. Right? With all his might. And David was, was girded with the linen ephod. That's the key. You guys know what an ephod is? You guys know what an ephod is? It's a priest garment. It's what priests wear. So he has on a priest garment. Who gave it to him? Look, let me tell you guys something. Let me show you how, how it works. Under the Old Testament, in the Torah, in the Tanakh, right, before Matthew, Mark, and Luke, 
You couldn't just say you were a king. You had to prove it through your bloodline. You couldn't just say you're a priest. You had to prove it. So how did you prove you were a priest? That's easy. You got that from another priest. This is what the Nazarite vow is all about. The Nazarite vow makes sure that you can be a priest even though you're not from the tribe of Levi. Do you guys know that? Which means that as a Nazarite, this is why Paul shaved his head and took the Nazarite vow. Did you guys know Samson was a Nazarite? Right? Did you know that Samson represents the carnal part of Jesus? Because Jesus is also from Nazareth, a Nazarite. Right? So what one man did, Samson, he did what a whole army could do. He did that by himself. He was a judge, and he was supposed to judge the Philistines. One man did what a whole army couldn't do, and he did it carnally. And Jesus showed up and did what a whole army couldn't do because he walked it out admirably in the spirit of God. The same strength that was in Samson was in Jesus, but he used it to heal the sick, to deliver. He did things so radical, but he had that same strength, but he didn't use any of it. See, we don't teach this stuff, and it irritates me. Because we have to know why things are put in place. He carried a whole gate. Jesus destroyed the gate. Samson used the jaw of a, of, of a, of a donkey. He defiled himself. A Nazarene can't touch anything that's dead. So he took a donkey jaw and started killing people. And Jesus touched the leper. He defiled himself, but he healed them. He didn't kill anybody. We don't. Come on, man. You want to know strength? Jesus. Samson didn't have nothing on Jesus. That's what a carnal Christian looks like. Samson. He kept doing what God told him not to do. And he still had the strength. And he still had the power. Because it has nothing to do. With the strength and power, it has to do with your covenant. And when you cut your hair, when you cut yourself off from God, that's what it's all about. That's what Jesus did on the cross. He cut himself off from life and everything, physically. But spiritually, you couldn't take it from him. Just like Samson, you couldn't take it from him because he's a Nazarene. His hair started growing back. Couldn't take it from him. Because it was given to him at birth. He lost sight. But he said, give me strength and I'll destroy them all. Right? And what did Jesus do? Jesus did the same thing, but he did it in the spirit. Destroyed them all. The pillars. Right? Come on, man. That's a whole nother conversation. Here we go. Where are we at? Oh, yeah. So David and all the household of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with sounds of trumpets. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Micah, Saul's daughter, looked through the window and saw the king leaping and dancing before everyone despised himself. And she despised him in his heart. And they brought into the ark of the Lord and set it in this place in the midst of the tabernacle. And David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings. Who's doing the offerings, guys? David, he's doing the burnt offering, which means he's taking on the, the priestly role, because that's what a priest does. Right? The burnt offering, the peace offering before the Lord. And as soon as David had made the end of the offering, the burnt offering and the peace offering, and blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts, and he dealt among all the people, even among the whole multitude of Israel as well, to the women and men, everyone a piece of cake, bread, Good piece of flesh, flagon of wine. So all the people departed, everyone to their house. So this is what he did. He started blessing everybody. He started blessing everybody because he knew he was blessed, right? He knew he was going to be blessed, right? So the blessing is not for you. It's for everybody around you, okay? Bless me, bless me. No, Lord, use me. And in using you, he'll bless you. That's what it's about. Then David returned. To bless his household. 
He blessed his own household, guys. Come on, man. And look what, his, look what Micah says. Micah says, Then David returned, blessed his household. And Micah, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of the servants as one of the vain fellows, shamelessly uncovering himself. And David said unto Micah, It was before the Lord which chose me, before thy father and before all his house, to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore I will play before the Lord, and I will yet be more vile than thus. And I will be based in my own sight. I will be based in my own sight. And of the maiden servant which thou hast spoken of them, shall I be um, had in honor. What he's saying is, this is nothing. You think this is crazy? You think I'm looking stupid now? You ain't seen nothing yet. That's what he's saying. This is nothing. I've just begun to realize some stuff. I've just begun to find out who God is for me. This is nothing. I just dance with all my might. I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow. <laughs> That's how real God was to him. Now, why am I reading this to you? I'm going to read it to you because this is a foreshadow of something. And I'm going to show you what it's trying to show you. Okay? Go to Luke. You guys ready? Luke chapter 1. Man, here we go. Thank you, Jesus. Luke chapter 1. 26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph in the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord uh, is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast and cast in her mind, what manner of salutation should this be? Like, she's, like, confused, right? And the angel said unto her, fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Here it is. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth the son, and shall call his name Jesus. And he shall be great, and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Meaning, I, I never slept with anybody. Like, how am I? And the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. And the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore, also the holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So what happened was an angel said, hey, there's going to be something inside of you. Kind of like what was in that box. <laughs> 39. And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into the city of Judah. And entered into the house of Zacharias. And saluted Elizabeth. Let me give you some context. You guys know who Zacharias is? A priest. Elizabeth is also a priest. Now, what do you think Mary would be doing going to the house of a priest? And I'm going to read something to you that's going to shock you. You ready? Watch this. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe, the babe leaped in her womb. Watch this. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. This is before Pentecost.
But that doesn't line up with my theology. The hell with your theology. That's what it says. It says she was filled with the Holy Ghost. Did she pray for it? Did she ask for it? Why was she filled with the Holy Ghost? Because the presence of God was at her doorstep. But Mary didn't know. Doesn't matter. God knew. <laughs> God ain't worried about what you know. He only needs to know what he knows. And he knows he's Lord. And he knows he's God. And he knows what he knows. Right? I love that. People get like, what? She was filled with the Holy Ghost? Was she praying in tongues? What was going on? It's what it says. Here's one. John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Ghost in the womb before he was even born. The covenant didn't matter. What mattered was God said, that's what's going to happen. What? You're, what, 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 what? See, this will mess you up. Kind of like that verse in Genesis chapter 4 where it says, in Genesis chapter 4 it says God said and she's appointed me another seed instead of the one who Cain slew which was Seth and then they had another ch uh, child named Enos and then right after that it says and then men began to call on the name of the Lord that's in Genesis chapter 4 there's this verse that says Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be. In Genesis chapter 4, they were calling on the name of the Lord. That's what it says. Saved from what? That's a whole nother conversation. Does that mean they're not going? Does that mean they were going to heaven? That's not what salvation is. Salvation is understanding. That heaven's on the inside of you. You ain't going anywhere when you understand who you are here. I'm telling you, don't misunderstand me. Jesus is coming back, but he's going to reign here. He's going to reign here. Adam and Eve, they would have lived forever. Where? Here. We forget that. Oh, they'd have lived forever. Where, in heaven? No, here. I know it's going to mess your theology up. But that's what it says. That's what it says. I'll give an example. The Bible says it'll be like the days of Noah. Some will go. Some will stay. That's what it says. There'll be two in the field. One will go. One will stay. Yeah? There'll be two laying down. One will go. Want to stay? Watch this. I'm going to mess you all up. Who wants to go? The Bible says it'll be like the day of Noah. Did Noah go anywhere? Why didn't he go anywhere? He's the one that had to plant for the kingdom. What you think you're going to do? You ain't going anywhere. You're going to sow. And when you die, you gone. So we're all leaving. Why are you in a hurry? Take your time. So it's both and, not either or. Right? So we're all going to be going off to Jesus. All of us are going to go with Jesus. We're all going to meet Jesus in the sky because we're all going to die one day. But until then, so. So I'm not saying you're not going to go. What I'm saying is why you want to go. If you're supposed to bring heaven here on earth, what's going to happen when we bring heaven here on earth? You're going to want to go? But now you do. So why don't we bring heaven here on earth so people won't want to leave? Problem is we don't want to do what God's called us to do. That's why everybody wants to leave. Yeah? I know that'll mess with your theology. But what do you think Jesus was doing? Why do you think they stoned him? They didn't, they didn't, why do you think they tried to stone him? Why do you think they tried to kill him? Because he was saying what everybody else wanted to hear? Come on, man. Sheesh. All right, let me, let, me, let, me, let me mess your noodles up. 
Are you waiting on the resurrection or are you in the resurrection? Which one? Well, if you're not in the resurrection, you're not born again. You need to die. Because it's his resurrection power that we live in. And if you've been raised from the dead, it means something died. And if something died, then something had to come alive. And if something came alive, it's through the resurrection power. So if you have resurrection power, why aren't you resurrecting some stuff? I'm just saying. Resurrect some dreams, some ideas, some put hands on you. <laughs> Raise yourself from the dead. Hey, did you guys know that Jesus was a priest? Who trained him? John the Baptist. John the Baptist trained him. How do we know John the Baptist trained him? Because he came to make ready the way. Who's the way? Who did he make ready? How did he make him ready? Hey, did, did John the Baptist have disciples? Yeah. Was Jesus one of them? He had to baptize him. And when he baptized him, his followers started following Jesus, and he said, I must decrease, or, and he must increase, which means that, yeah, let him go. See, we don't ever talk about this stuff. Jesus had to be trained to be a priest. He couldn't just say it. He had to be trained, guys. We forget that. Because, look, you're dealing with, man, you're dealing with Pharisees and Sadducees that are going to poke holes in everything you say. You think they didn't like how, why are you a priest? Why are you saying you're a priest? Prove to us you're a priest. Prove it. You say you're the king. This is why Matthew starts off, right? Son of David. Son of Abraham. Why? Because you need to know his blood. His bloodline is, is royalty. He comes from Abraham, but you need to know his bloodline is royalty. So the scriptures say that. So he comes from the lineage of David. So we can't, we can't ignore that. So how can we prove he's a priest? Well, John the Baptist was raised by two priests, which means he was a priest. He was doing mikvah in the middle of the desert, right? He wasn't a fan of the temple. He said, you root of vipers. Why? Because he wasn't a fan. He wasn't going to the temple. He was baptizing in the desert. He didn't want nothing to do with them. And so what happens? He's out there in the desert. He's baptizing. And that's where he baptizes Jesus. And so he's not a fan. He's not a fan of the system because he knows the system's going to be destroyed. Because I don't know if you guys know this or not, Jesus came to destroy the temple. He came to destroy it. He was giving people a way out. He said, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it. Meaning your temple's going to be gone because I'm the sacrifice. And when I'm sacrificed, there'll be no more need for sacrifices. So if there's no more need for sacrifices, what you need a temple for? I'm about to move into you. What you need a temple for? Man. We don't like to hear that. Jesus came to destroy the system. Guys, think about it. He preached for three years. But the minute he went to Jerusalem, he didn't last a week. He knew it. When I go to Jerusalem, they're going to kill me because that's where they're at. He didn't last a week. Within a week, he was dead. Okay. And I'll prove it. It was John the Baptist. They asked Jesus, by what authority do you do these things? That means, uh, who's your rabbi? Who gave you this authority to, uh, to say you're a rabbi? Because we don't know you. You didn't train with us. Right? There's two schools. The school of Shammai and the school of Hillel. Two schools. Two trains of thought. And, and nobody trained Jesus. So he's like, who, by what authority do you say you're a rabbi? We don't know you. And Jesus said, I'll answer you this. I'll answer you if you tell me this. By what authority did John the Baptist speak? Was it authority of man or of God? 
And they didn't want to answer because if they would have answered, they would have said of God, he would have said, then why didn't you believe him? But if he would have said a man, they would have got stoned to death. So they said, we don't know. And he's like, then I don't know either. Because that was the answer. John the Baptist. We, we don't teach this stuff. Because it ruffles feathers, right? But he's a priest. He was trained by a priest. He was trained by John the Baptist. That's why John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit since birth. Because he was brought just for that. To train him into the priesthood. A whole nother conversation, right? So here we go. So Mary goes there. And it came to pass, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spoke out with a loud voice and said, blessed art thou among women. And blessed is the fruit of, whoo, like, whoa, my God. Because she's a priest. She's like, man, I know what's on the inside of you. Like, whoa, whoa. I'm going to faint. She got filled with the Holy Ghost. Wouldn't it be awesome if you could just show up and someone just gets filled with the Holy Ghost? That's what happened here. She didn't be like, so do you believe in Jesus? Do you? No, man, this is the priest who recognizes the presence of God. Come on, man. Jeez. (sighs) Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is it to me that the mother of God would come unto me? Like the mother, like David was like, oh, who am I? That would come? He's all scared. And she's like, oh, man, I'm blessed. Different attitude here. Right? Different attitude. I like using this little verse here because, like, people come visit you from church. Like, oh, why they got to come over? Well, when you know what they got, come on. Come over. I know what you're hosting. I know it's on the inside of you. I might not like the whole ox thing, but come on. For lo, right? Oh, here's it is. Here's it is in 56. Here's the kicker. Luke chapter 156. And Mary abode with her three months. So what do you think was happening at that house for three months? What do you think was happening at? the house of Zacharias for three months. The same thing that happened in 2 Samuel chapter 6. The whole house was blessed. But you know what's cool? Mary got to go home with that. And the blessings never stopped. Now, Jesus is born. And he has to be trained to also carry what he has on the inside of him. That's why John the Baptist was there. Who's training you to carry it? Who's training you to carry it? See, that's the problem in the church. Ain't nobody training anybody to carry nothing. Everybody has power. Everybody's a king. Everybody's a saint. Everybody's got this gift. and that. But who's training you how to carry it? Who's teaching you how to have reverence to that thing? Who's showing you what you should and shouldn't do with that spirit? That's a crazy thought, but that's what's missing in the body. We don't have fathers anymore. We don't have shepherds anymore. We don't have people like, hey, this is how you take care of it. Look, man, when you take care of the presence of God, this is what happens. How do I know? Look at my life. I'm blessed. You want to be blessed? You want to walk in some stuff? It's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you everything that's going to keep you from walking in it, which is you. (laughs) Deny yourself. Come on, man. (sighs) Guys, this is crazy. Do you guys remember when Jesus said, pick up your cross and follow me? Deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. It's an amazing thing that he says that as a Christian. We're like, yay. We say it all the time. Don't we say that? No, deny yourself. Pick up. We say it all the time, like it's like, you know, nonchalant, it's no big deal, right? Because that's kind of what we say as Christians. But did you know when Jesus said it, it didn't mean what we think it means. Did you know that? Because let me tell you what it means when Jesus said it to his disciples. Under the law in Deuteronomy chapter 22, it says that anyone who dies on a tree is cursed by God. So when he's saying, pick up your cross and follow me, they have a totally different idea than what we say it is. 
Because remember, they were under the old covenant. He hadn't died yet. Sin hadn't been purchased yet. So they're still under the law. Remember, Jesus carried the cross under the law. God didn't call him a sinner. The law did. See, we don't want to say that. God didn't call Jesus a sinner. The law did. Because Jesus even said, didn't the law of Moses say that I said? <laughs> the law of Moses said that I said. You know, there's this heart behind the law that we don't ever talk about. Do you remember when the woman was caught in adultery? Do you remember? Do you remember Jesus was, he was standing up, and then they brought the woman, and immediately when they brought the woman, he started doing this. Started writing in the dirt. And they brought this woman and said, hey, this woman was caught in adultery. The law of Moses. Look, what they're doing is they're trying to trap Jesus. They're trying to get him into a corner where they can, they want to use the law to trap Jesus. The one who wrote it. Think about it. We going to use the law. Good luck with that one. Right? They say that the Messiah is to be smarter than Solomon. That was Jesus. And wiser. Right? So here's what's crazy. So they say, hey, this woman was caught in adultery. The law of Moses said we should stone her. What say you? So they put him in a position as judge and executioner. So they put him in the place of Moses. That's what they did. So they're watching him and say, okay, let's see what he does. Because if he stones her, they're going to call him a liar. And if he lets her go, he's going to go against the law of Moses. So either way, we got this guy. He's going down, right? So he went down the first time. Now, remember, a prophet, the way Jesus teaches, there's some scriptures that say Jesus sat thus. And because the way a prophet moves or a rabbi, he teaches with everything. He teaches with his body. He teaches with things. He points. He uses people, blind people. Like, he, everything's a stage. So what Jesus does is when, they see, when he sees them coming, he already knows what they're doing. So he writes in the ground, and then he stands up, and they confront him, and they say this to him, and he goes back down again, and he writes again, and then he goes back up, right? Now, as a Westerner, you won't get this. As an Easterner, you know what's going on, okay? Let me explain this. Um, does anybody play piano in here? Do you play piano with one hand or two hands? What happens if you play piano just with one hand? Are you getting the whole melody or just half of it? See, Westerners don't get the full melody. They just get this. If you don't know the culture, you don't get this. And Paul said, the one who can bring the old and the new together, right? So let me, let me give some context. When he does this, he's telling them something. Let's go back to Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai. Moses, he goes up to God, up the mountain, right? He's up here. And what does God do? He takes his finger, he writes the law, and Moses comes down off the mountain, and he catches all of Israel in adultery, worshiping a golden calf. So he smashes the law, and he goes back up the mountain, and God pulls his finger out. And writes it again. And then Moses comes down. And Jesus is saying, okay, you want to address the law? Let's address the heart of Moses. See, Moses caught you all in adultery. But he smashed the law so you could all live. And he stood up for you. And he said, no, I'm going to destroy them. I'm going to blaze hot. I'm going to kill them all. Get away from me. And Moses said, no, don't do that to them. Don't do that to them. He said, you'll be my Noah. I'll kill them all and I'll start with you. He's like, no, Lord. And what was, God, what was Jesus saying? You missed it. You talked about the law, but you didn't address the heart of Moses. And if it wasn't for him, you'd all be dead. Context. He who cast the first stone. Is without sin. So whoever would have stoned her would have been next. 
So he didn't say don't stone her. He said the one that's without sin, cast the first stone. Oh, snap. If I hit her, I'm saying I don't have sin, and you going next. You see how that works? That's context, right? That's a lot to chew on, right? The entire Bible is written like that. It's threaded, right? It's all connected. He answers himself. It's crazy. He asks the question and answers it. This is the most. So let's go to uh, 1 John, or let's go to John 1.12. You guys getting anything? Hey, this is your story. You know that, right? Because this is what's on the inside of you. Look, God didn't just stop being God because you don't know it. The thing is, we got to get you to understand what it is that's happened to you so you can walk in it. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of our Lord. Through the knowledge. You got to know some stuff. You know, people tell me, you don't need no knowledge. Yeah, you do. You need to know who God is for you. Because if you don't know who God is for you, how is God going to remind you of who he is if you don't know who he is? Holy Spirit comes to remind you of something. Remind you of what? Something that you already know. If it's reminding you, you already know something. If you don't know, he can't remind you. Oh, I just want a revelation. Just get a revelation of the Christ in you, the hope of glory. Let's do that. My favorite verse right here, John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received them, have you guys received them? To them he gave power. Watch this. Power to cast out devils. Power to heal the sick. Power for words of knowledge. Power for dreams and visions. What does it say here? What's the power for? To what? So the power was given to you so you could become something. Not so you could do something. Because when you become something, you don't have to do nothing. Because in becoming, it just happens. Right? See, that's the problem. Like, and we all claim to be sons of God, but we don't become sons of God. Because it's a process, guys. It's it's a like hear me out. Don't misunderstand me. You got out spiritually, but mentally we didn't. Okay? This is why Romans chapter 12, verse 2 is so important. Do not conform to this world, but be transformed. So does God transform you, or do you transform you? Physically, who transforms you? Do not conform to this world, but be transformed. By. So what happens if you don't renew your mind? You're not going to transform. This isn't. Transformers 101, you're not like, no. That's not what happens. The Holy Spirit comes and I'm transformed. That's not what this is about. You got to know what you're transforming into. Because what if you transform into Christ, but you don't even know who he is? Oh. I'm going to show you guys something. This is is spiritually discerned. Let me show you something. Can I see that microphone real quick? Don't turn on. Don't turn on. All right, let me show you guys something. All right, everybody, what's this, guys? A microphone? Okay. Let me show you the difference between seeing and imagining. Okay? I want you all to see this microphone. Do you see it? Okay. Now, if I would have held my hand up and said, hey, imagine a microphone. One would have thought of a blue one, a red one, a green one. All, like, everybody would have had a different imagination of a microphone. Yeah? But I didn't ask you guys to imagine. I asked you to see it. Do you see it? Here's the problem in the body. We're imagining Jesus. We're not seeing him. You're imagining who he is. You don't know who he is. I'm being serious. You got to know him. Right here. You look into this and you'll know him. 
See, a lot of Christians don't want to read this because they're too busy imagining what he is. I don't want you to imagine my Jesus. He's not, look, I'm not imagining my wife. I know what my wife looks like. I'm not like, let me imagine my wife. She's real. I'm not imagining anything. I'm seeing my wife. I'm seeing my kids. I'm seeing my, I know who he is. I'm not imagining. Cast down every imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. We're teaching people to imagine who Jesus is. I don't want you to imagine him. I want you to see him. I want you to know him. I want you to walk in him and know him. See, we don't know who Jesus is. We imagine who we want him to be. And he's not your imagination. He's not Puff the Magic Dragon. Right? He's the real deal. And the thing is, it says, let us make man in our image, not your image. <laughs> ah, Jesus. Why am I saying this? Because <laughs> what's on the inside, he's not playing around. It's real. It's the real deal, right? And my job as a teacher is to bring you to a place where you're in awe of who God is for you. You have to be in awe of who God is. And awe means I get to share that. It's not mine. It's his. It's his awe. I get to join in his awe, right? Like, awe, oh, the reverence of who he is. It's his. And we get to partner with that. But it's still his. And you know when Jesus said, the glory that I have I give unto you, it isn't given to you so you can do whatever you want. The glory means the image, the goodness. You guys remember Moses? He said, show me your glory, and he showed him his back. You know, there's a whole rabbinical teaching behind that. It's called the behind and the front, right? And it's interesting because uh, when, and I talked about this, when God put Moses in the cleft of the rock, that cleft is a hole. And that hole was put there when they struck the rock because it's the same mountain that that chunk of rock came off of that spewed water in the desert. And it said that that rock was Jesus. Paul confirms it. So that rock was Jesus spewing out water. But it came from the mountain because the mountain represented God, and it came from the mountain. So it was like the part of God, right, came out. And so when Moses went up there, God stuck him in there. Boom, put him in the hole where the rock was gone. And when he stuck him in there, he seen the spirit of Christ come out of the rock. Boom, seen the back of him, covered him. I was like, whoa. He said, show me your goodness. That's what glory means. Show me your goodness. And you know what his goodness was? I'll show you my back. I'll show you this. This is what I'm going to show you. This is my goodness. Right here. Thousands of years later, the Messiah would be on a dead post, getting his back whooped, saying, I'll show you my goodness. I show it to you. Right there. Whip it. Hit it. Do whatever you want to it. That's my goodness. I'll let you whip me, beat me, do whatever you want. And I'll still say, and what? I still love you. Come on, man. See, Moses couldn't see his face yet because they hadn't entered a covenant yet. It wasn't until they sprinkled the blood on the Ten Commandments and on the people. Then he could see them. And it was a different covenant. Because now when he'd go up, his face would be glowing. Because he was in his presence because of the covenant. And Jesus said, I'll give you my back and show you my goodness. And on the cross, he showed you his face. Man. Come on, think about it. I'm going to tell you why this is important. Because under the law, you cannot see a naked body. And the only way you can see Jesus is if you turn your back on the law. And you say, to hell with the law. I want to see the face of Jesus. 
Come on, I'm not saying that the law is, come on, he came to fulfill the law, which is his heart. It was his heart. It was always his heart. And it was sad because when Moses came down off the mountain, it was a gift. The law was a gift. He wasn't going to impose it on them. He was just going to give it to them. But they were cheating on him. And now he can't trust them. And he's like, I can't trust you now. I can't trust you. You cheated on me. I have to have a counselor. I have to bring you back to me. I'm jealous for what you've done. I'm hurting. You hurt me. You hurt my heart. That's what the law is. The law is I don't trust you. I'll never trust you. And Jesus said I had to come as God in the flesh to die because I've always wanted to trust you. I've always wanted to trust you. Come on, Come on man. That's the heart of God. Like, I want to trust you, man. I want to give it to you. I want to bless you. I want to love you. I want that for you. And that's why he had to come to die. It says, unless, if a woman is married to a man, she cannot marry another unless he die. So God came in the flesh so he could die, so they could be free, so I could trust you again. Man, he trusts me. He trusts me. He trusts me with his presence. He trusts me with his power. He trusts me. That's the gospel. He trusts us. It's a hard pill to swallow, but it has to be swallowed nevertheless. It's a powerful reality, man. He's, he's, he's on the cross naked. He got no clothes on him. No clothes on him. Everybody turned their backs on him. All the Jews had to turn their backs on him because the law says you can't see a naked man. And you can't see a man on a tree who's cursed by God. Hide your face from this man. And there was three people at the cross. Mary, the other Mary, and John. John said, I don't care. I don't care. Where were the other 12? Where, where were the 11? Where were they at? Where were they? They were afraid to look at Jesus on the cross because they didn't want to get caught. And Jonathan is like, I don't care. I love you. And you know I love you. Whew. That's sonship. And Jesus said, woman, this is your son. Son, this is your woman. That's sonship. I'm going to die, but I'm going to leave her in your hands. And that's the church. It's in our hands. Because he trusts us with his heart. And that's why I'm here. Like, come on, man. You got to see his heart. It's his heart. Jeez. You're his heart. That's what this is about. You're his heart, man. You are his heart. He loves you. And that's what this is about, man. If you can feel that in your heart, man, that's not me. I'm just reminding you of what he's done. And don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed of what he's done. It's a, it's a, it's a horrible thing, man. So, guys, tomorrow I'm going to be talking about the fire of God and the consuming fire and the baptism of the Holy Spirit and why it's there. And, and I believe that God's talking to your heart tonight to prepare the ground. There's a rabbinical teaching about the soil. It's Peshat, Ramez, Drash, and Sod. It's about the soil. It's never about the seed because the seed always works. It's about what soil are you because the seed's about to do something. The seed always does something. And I'm here just to push it along. And that's why I'm here. Right? And it's the heart of God. If the heart of God ain't in the message, it's just Pete. Right? 
And it's taken me a long time to recognize this, man. I've, I've, I've burned a lot of bridges. I've hurt a lot of people. I've, I've stumbled along the way. But I know my calling. And I don't underestimate the power of my calling or the power of my purpose. And it's to get the people ready to release the king because the king wants to, he wants to thrive in your home. He wants to thrive in your relationships. He wants to thrive. And he wants to thrive for me and he wants to thrive for you, you know. And so I'm sorry if I don't have the glam and the this and that. I just have the heart of Jesus, man. And if that ain't enough, you need to go somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. It's a beautiful, beautiful truth. Now, remember this. If you're in this room, this is a beautiful, beautiful thought. You didn't ask to be born. None of you. None of you said, hey, God, I want to be born, which proves that he thought about you which proves that he willed you to be here. Which is beautiful because that means that if you didn't ask to be born, then he has a responsibility to you. And if, he didn't, if you didn't ask him to be born, then he has to provide for you because he willed you here. And if he willed you here, he's going to take care of you. And when you recognize that, Father, you wanted me here and you created me and you thought about me before I was even here, you thought, about everything I was going to do, and you already provided a way for me to make it happen through your spirit. And that's you, and that's all of us. And because we didn't ask to be born, then we're here for a reason. And once we find out what that reason is, we can thrive in it. But he's not going to leave you desolate. He's not going to leave you alone. He's going to provide for you in every area of your life because what kind of father would bring a child to this world and not take care of him? And I'm just here to remind you, he wants to take care of you. And he wants to love on you. He wants to more than ever, right? And so we're going to end it tonight with some prayers. Is that okay? Guys, if you felt a shift in your heart, that's just Christ in you, the hope of glory, right? And he wants to do things in your life. And this is the only place... The only place where Jesus can be manifested. Because when you go to heaven, you can't. So all that Jesus is can be manifested here. And that's why you were called. And that's why he created you. So you can manifest his glory here. That's a powerful truth. Right? So guys, we're just going to pray. If you guys need prayer tonight, I believe that the word of God is going to do what it said it would do. Father... You said you would confirm your word with signs and wonders, Lord God. I gave your word, and it's all on you. I don't feel any pressure because it's all you. And I love you, Lord, and I know you love them. And, Father, I thank you for what you're going to do. And I thank you that before they even go home or even in their sleep, Lord God, you're going to do things that no one can do. You're going to heal. You're going to deliver. You're going to set free. You're going to cause fires to stir, Lord God. You're going to do mighty works, Lord God, because they're taking your presence home, Lord. They're taking it home, Father. So if you guys need prayer, if you guys want to come up, I got some guys like Coelho, and, and, if, and we got some people that can pray. If you guys want to pray, we got, if, man, it, this is not, we are hosting the presence of God. If you always wanted to pray for someone, tonight's the night. You're not going to, you're not going to embarrass God, I, I promise you. Right? What if he wants to use you tonight? What if he doesn't want just for you to receive a healing, but he wants to use you to administer it, right? So can we do that? Can we all pray for each other, right? Can we do that? Would that work? Did you guys get something out of it tonight? Come on, Jesus. Thank you. How many of you are going to be able to be with us tomorrow? We'll be with us tomorrow. Come on. I don't know about you, but, but I'm, I'm just blown away. Hey guys, thank you. Thank you for stopping by. Please subscribe to my channel. If you liked it, please leave a comment down below. Let me know what you thought about this content, about this video. And uh, please don't be afraid to share this. And if you like this, go ahead and hit that like button, thumbs up. And uh, don't forget to turn your notifications on. So I appreciate you guys. Thank you for being a part of Royal Family International University. Don't forget to turn your notifications on.